Grace and peace to you. This is yours truly, Bishop Bowser, coming at you once again. Uh, you know, there is a great racial divide between blacks and Mexicans, uh, especially in Southern California. I must say that things are better now than when I was out in the streets in the 70s and the 80s. And here is why. Let me tell you why. The difference that I see and how why things are better today than they were at least in my time from my lens in San Diego, right? Um, uh, in our belief system, what has the most profoundest effect is our personal experiences. And so I speak from personal experiences, not from a survey or or gathering the facts of what different people think, but just my opinion on it. And I could be wrong. Um, but what I observed and what I have seen, the difference is, is, and I, I got a video that I'm going to show at the end of what I have to say about me addressing the black and brown issue in San Diego back when I was coming up. When you talk about the racial tension and the violence that we committed against each other. When you talk about blacks and Latinos or um, Mexican Chicanos, and some say I believe they Mexicanos. Um, I may be pronouncing these things wrong, these labels wrong, terms wrong, I should say. Forgive me if I am. I mean no harm. But um, what I have observed today, right, <clears throat> is that is the, the, the racial divide is not really black and Mexican, right? Um, when you when you looking in the streets and you're looking at the gang culture and the prison culture. Now for me, I've never been to prison. Um, got out of the gang when I was 22 and a half years old. Um, but I was a part of the gang lifestyle and I've seen what happened back then. And I do a lot of work today in regards to gangs working with black and brown, black and Latino, right? Uh, Mexicans and Hispanics. Uh, today. And so I see the difference um, between what's a Mexican issue and what's really a South Sider issue. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. A lot of young people that I deal with today, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, 18 years old, even 19 years old, even some I saw in their 20s that never been to prison and Mexican um, they, a lot of them, not all, but a lot of them are deeply entrenched in the hip hop culture and therefore they have to deal with black people, right? In the music, in the style, in the talk, in the dress, a lot of that. And what I found with these youngsters is, is that they don't really have no qualm, qualm with, no qualm with, <clears throat> excuse me, with black people. They don't hate on black people. They don't care about working with seeing and being in the presence of black people and so on. They don't have no issue. In fact, I've talked to older Mexicans who been to prison, been a part of the South Side of San Angels and uh, Mexican Mafia and so on. And what they tell me is that the youngsters really don't listen to the shot callers and those that given orders from the prison um, today, right? They, they kind of frustrated with that with um, dealing with the youngsters, the young Mexicans, because they're not listening, they say. Um, they're not following orders. They're still doing drive-bys. They're still doing a lot of rivalry shootings and things like that and some other things that they're not following. But what I found out is that <clears throat> only those that have been institutionalized by the prison gang culture, when I'm talking about Mexicans and Southsiders and so on, those are the ones that really follow the orders, that really um, stay on cold when it comes to um, their relationship and dealing with other people. One of the things that I found and I thought, because I've, I've in this violence interruption work that I do, I'm a violence interrupter, I have an organization, Shafat Outreach, and we work with black and Mexican gangs. And the thing that I found is trying to work with the Mexican guys who were part of the Southsiders and part of that prison culture, gang culture, right? 
many of them have a problem with working with me as a black man, right? And collaborating together and things like that. At first, I thought it was purely a racial thing. But I had a pastor that's from Central California, up there, I think, where the Bulldogs are and all of that. And we sat down, and he shared with me <clears throat> that he has the same issue that I had. And I didn't tell him nothing about my issue. He was just saying, man, working with those guys, blah, 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 X, Y, and Z. And everything he was telling me, I was in my mind like, that's exactly what I've been experiencing with them. And I thought it was racial. But he's a Mexican, and they treating them the same way. But then what I found out was, when I really looked at it, I said, oh, it's a South Sider thing. That's what it really is uh, as far as that prison gang culture. And I don't know, sometimes it can be conscious bias and sometimes it can be unconscious bias. But for sure, they all follow that culture, right? And if you're a black person that work with them, most of the time you have to fall into a subservient position. But if you're, if you're a leader and you demand respect as a leader, and you think for yourself and you're independent, they're not going to really work with you and collaborate with you because they have to be at the top. They have to rule. They have to be supreme in, in the things that they do. That's been at least my experience for those whose mindset have not been transformed. I have Mexicans on my team with the Shafat team, and there's not a racist bone in their body or bias bone in their body. And uh, they see all people the same, different cultures. And of course, you know, we have our, our biases, but in general and overall, uh, they're good people, right? Uh, the young people that I work with, the young Mexicans that I work with, male and female, they don't have no problem whatsoever, right? But it's those that has been institutionalized by the prison gang culture that really have the issue. I found that even Latinas, are, are willing to work with us and really reach out to us as far as blacks and so on and do things together and so on. And then any Mexican that is not a part of that prison gang culture, also very uh, loving and kind and unbiased when it comes to working with us, being inclusive and supporting us and so on. But the difference I found was within the... Um, uh, the, the south side of thing. That's where the problem is. And let me just say this when we talk about that being the problem is that when you talk about the violence and the killings and things like that, um, a, a shout out to Red Supreme TV, Doves, uh, Gunners Collective, and Hoodie from the Hood. They really laid some things out. And Damien, I believe his name is. Um, yeah. They really raise, uh, um, lay some things out about prison because I know nothing about that and how things work and how things go on the black side and the brown side. That really helped me, and I appreciate uh, the information that was shared uh, with me in regards to that because it helped me to understand a little bit better of some of the things that's going on. I have my homeboys and different people share with me about the racial divide in the prisons and so on. But they really all share some good information Red Supreme TV really struck a chord with me because he dived deeper into some of the issues and so on, especially when you talk about reparations and the violence that's committed against blacks and so on. And so, but the younger generation, um, they're not really caught up in that. They have not been institutionalized by the prison gang culture, but those have been touched by that. Unless their mind is transformed, they continue to think that way, where even whether they want to or not, they have an issue working with black people. And so um, that's been my experience uh, with this. So now I'm going to play a tape to explain the history of back when I was coming up versus now, because the black gangs and the Mexican gangs, some of them are allies and a lot of them get along together. Uh, and so there's no shooting and killing each other like it was back in our day when I was coming up and so on. And I'm going to explain that in a video I did about three years ago. All right, God bless you in the video right now. So what was uh, uh, you guys' relationship with Mexicans back then? <clears throat> that was, that <clears throat> excuse me, that's a good question because, um, and this is what the black gangs don't understand when they're dealing with the coast and what happened when we switched from these to 
shoot is because over in the coast especially us down in the 20s the rolling 20s you know um and i can tell you a story about that but um over in the coast we lived down in the 20s and down in the 20s and where we hung out at in the 20s was where all the mexicans were and and you know i don't know what happened but something eventually what is our corner you know uh, uh 25th street uh there the, used to be a liquor store right here called past liquor store and this is where we would hang out at you know all day long getting high and so on sometimes we go across the street and and what have you but this was our spot 25th street and you know when he got around 9 10 o'clock we would walk down the pier and go up to 30th street where all the other homies were hanging out and we would get up there and my homeboy the one i remember start coining coining the phrase is uh, Alvin Hayes, who probably going to be getting out in, in a little bit. He did about uh, almost, he did a, about 30 years for, for murder, and he's geared to get out. But we strolled up the 30th Imperial, and uh, he would see us coming up, and he said, here come the 25th Street fellas. That was, but he didn't mean it from a perspective we different from them, but this is where we hung out, right here on 25th Street. And they most of the time hung out on 33rd Street. So you know, there's 25th Street fellas, and there's Trey, 33rd, the Trayella. You know, one of the things I used to say is Trayella, Trayella, do like I tell her, come be the best with the 25th Street fellas. And um, then we, we, we went and got some shirts where we put Deuce 5 on the back. That's when we start calling ourselves Deuce 5. And they start calling themselves Trey Trey. And, um, uh, and then from there, it was 4-5. I remember when we was talking about it. And it said, you know, uh, anything from, from the 20s on down is, uh, the 20s on down is uh, rolling 20s. And 30s on up, rolling 30s, and that's when we became rolling 20s and rolling 30s, and so on. But um, uh, and so down here, the 20s, as you see, like you see it now, that's the way it was back in our days. There was a lot of Latinos that lived here, Mexicans that lived here, and uh, they're friendly now. But back in the, back in our days, we faced a lot of hostility, and that's why we have to equalize it with the with guns and things like that. So with the way we were treated, even when we hung out here, we have to watch our back. Not just from the black gangs, but from the Mexican gangs also. So we was always under fire and under pressure. Couldn't a black person couldn't go by Chicano, couldn't walk by Chicano Park. We had to be careful, and we had to wait till everything was over with and done before we did that, right? Uh, because you had, you know, uh, they had whatever they had going on there. It was dangerous for us. And so um, even today, I still have a, a certain feeling when they talk about going to Chicano Park for things because I know how it was back in my days. But um, what ended up happening was is that we got tired of it, right? We got tired of them. They had us outnumbered. They were using sticks and knives and, and, and the big old butt belt buckles and things like that to fight us. And so we got guns and started shooting them. And, and, and so they, you know, either when they ran up on us, we packing and we put the heat on them or they mess with us, we come right back and sneak up on them <clears throat> and, and take care of business. And so, after we start doing that, I mean, some of them that was like hanging out, uh, living close to where our hangouts were, they moved. They had to get out. Others, when they saw us walking down the street, they didn't bother us no more, unless they had a gun too, and they had to be ready to throw down. But that was the equalizer. And we didn't get guns to kill people or to hurt people, but we got guns to protect ourselves. And so when you, when you talk, and, and, and at that time, over with the gangs over in, in, in um, uh, the black gangs, we were still just fighting. We weren't doing any shooting. We were just fighting. And that's the thing like a lot of other gangs don't realize is that at least uh, my homies that I ran with, and in 30s too, because some things jumped off up there too, is that we had an upper hand because we were already at war with the Mexicans. And we already had guns and had to start using guns on these guys, right? But we would keep our guns at home and every now and then pack them on us when we were hanging out in front of our house and going to the store No, there's going to be some Mexicans somewhere. So we didn't always have the guns with us, but we had we had the guns in case we needed them, right? If something jumped off or we knew we was going somewhere and we were going to run into something, then we would pack them with us. But most of the time we had the guns at home. So when we went to parties across town, we didn't take our guns. You know, we, we just went and we throw down and fight, whether we went to the park or anything like that. And um, where, the, I, where I saw the, 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 the turning point, the real turning point, because there's always shootings and things like that, but where I saw the real turning point when it became hard for us to go across town and just party and fight was when uh, Skyline, Skyline um, uh, robbed a gun store and they had a lot of guns and they were jacking us everywhere we went. <laughs> we go to a party, they popping up with all their guns, we had to get up on out of there, right? So then, when we went across town, we started taking our guns too, right? 
And then it got to a place where you couldn't even like take your gun across town and still party and say if somebody run up, they're gonna get blasted. You know, now it's like it got to it got so heavy like uh, I remember one time we walked, we drove by this party in Skyline. We was gonna go party, and they had all these all these gang members out there, and we knew they were packing, so we knew we couldn't go in there, right? So you know, uh, we had to do the other thing. But what I'm telling you is is that that's when we started doing these drive-bys and stuff because uh, when you're at war, you want to fight, and folks don't want to fight no more. They want to shoot. Then you know, my homie started shooting back. 